Anyway, we're so excited about being here. This is one of our favorite churches to visit. And Julie said, Julie said that we had just got back from Thailand last week. Actually, we just got back from Thailand this week. So I need your help today. If, I mean, I need you to be engaged because like, I, I, I might be delirious. I'm just telling the truth right now. So we were in Thailand. We saw 3,500 people come out. We distributed 3,000 books. We were just, to be honest with you, John and I never know if anybody's coming or not. We're like, maybe 50 people will show up. And so we were, all, we were just in awe of what God did. And so your, your church, I don't know if you know this or not, has been a really big part of that. Your church has sown into us and so we can sow into nations. They always are involved in what we do as Global Outreach, so thank you so much. We love your church. All right, I'm gonna show you my family picture. I've got more grandchildren since the last time I was here. Okay, so this is the craziness of our world. So that's my daughter-in-law, Juliana. She is amazing. She has birthed four grandchildren for me. Then there is my oldest son, Addison, and he has a baby on his lap. I promise no children were injured in this uh, photo shoot. It looks like he's getting ready to be smacked in the face, but Augustus is okay. Then there is my youngest son, Arden, who is actually here with us, holding Asher. John is holding Sophia, and I am holding Lizzie. Now, just look at Lizzie. You need to look at Lizzie because Lizzie is our kind of crazy grandchild. She is the one that has a very high level of nudity. I do think that she gets spanked more than any of the other ones. She told her mother the other day, I'm going to eat your face and choke you. And I was like, what is she watching on TV? And they said, oh no, we tell her all the time, you're so cute, we wanna eat your face. And then we also say, don't choke the baby. So she combined, don't choke the baby and eat your face. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're praying for Lizzie. And then there is Austin. Austin is 28, that's hard for me to believe. And then I have Alexander, who is 26. And that is exactly what I would look like if I was a man. So, uh, but I'm, I wanna talk to you about Lizzie a second. Because Lizzie is a little bit of a piece of work, and I do feel like it's my fault, because uh, Juliana, my daughter-in-law, is super sweet. Uh, we wrote a book kind of about Lizzie. I'm like, if you've got one that's crazy, you gotta somehow write a story where it ends well for them. So we wrote a book called Lizzie the Lioness, and the whole premise is that sometimes the most courageous thing you can do is to ask for help. Do I have any young parents here? You have kids that go to school. Okay, I don't know if this happened to you, but I would try to have deep and meaningful bonding moments with my children when they came home from school. How was your day? They'd be like, fine. Then at dinner time, we try to do it again. How was your day? Tell me about your favorite thing. We're not talking, mom. And then at bedtime, they had to unburden their soul. I'm like, really? I am exhausted now. I have no, I have nothing for you. And so what we did is we, like, I wrote a book that actually creates conversations for parents to have with their children. So that when the children are afraid of something, they actually know it's courageous to ask for help. And courage does not happen in isolation. Courage happens in community. And so I think I was inspired to write this book during one of those candlelight services with Lizzie crawling over our laps trying to take the fire from us. So anyway, we have that out there as a resource. And so I'm so thrilled to be able to have that. And then I'm gonna be preaching to you today out of a book I wrote called Without Rival. We have an identity and purpose crisis right now. I've had the incredible privilege over the last two years of standing in front of more than 50,000 millennials. And I'm gonna tell you this about millennials. There is nobody more brilliant and more well-educated, more well-connected than our millennials. And yet they have absolutely no idea what they're supposed to do. And here's the reason for that though. See, I believe that there are a generation that is called to do something that has never been done before. And when you are called to do something that has never been done before, you can't keep looking at what everybody else is doing to try to figure out what you're called to do. I believe they're a prophetic generation. 
I believe that they are going to rise up strong in the land, but I do believe that they need some of the older generation to help them find their way. And so for the next 30 minutes, I am adopting you as the Sicilian grandmother. Now, I, uh, you already knew I was a grandmother, but I am not just any kind of grandmother. I am a Sicilian grandmother. And if you don't know what that is, I'll explain that to you. Sicilians are Greeks, Arabs, and Italians mixed. They came together and gave the world the mafia. You are welcome. So, kind of the range of interests is anything from feeding you to killing you. So that's kind of where I'm gonna be talking about. So I'm gonna be talking about your best year ever. I heard this from Pastor Todd last night. I got super excited because I'd already sent him my notes and my whole idea was about vision. And you know, comparison is not vision. And if you're going to have the best year ever, I'm gonna give you a couple points that I've learned in the length of my life. Number one, you gotta know when you are. I didn't say where you are, when you are. We're in a very interesting time zone. Now, I have embarrassing stories about time zones because sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had like the Apple Watch or the iPhone that doesn't switch time zones and I've missed a flight and had to overnight in another country before. Because I'm just sitting in the lounge thinking, I've got a whole nother hour when really my plane took off and I show up and everybody's gone. It's a horrible nightmare, it's reoccurring. I've only done it once. But that was all because I didn't know when I was. And we are in a day and a time without rival. We are in days and times beyond measure. Acts 2.17 says, and this is what I will do in the last days. This is God talking. This is not the president talking. This is not me talking. This is the promise of God. This is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy. And your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all my servants men and women alike, and they will prophesy. What does that even mean? Well, it means that there's going to be a generation that contrary to what everything looks like, they're going to stand in the face of despair and discouragement, and they are going to speak faith and hope and strength and life and love. We are going to actually be a generation that stands right in the midst of problems and declares answers. See, most people think they're anointed to criticize, but you are not anointed to criticize. You are anointed to prophesy. It doesn't take any wisdom to say that there is a mess. How many of y'all know it's a mess out there? It's a mess. Well, I need you. I need you, just as we were singing. I need you to use your words to speak God's will into this earth. I need you to be old women, like me, and young men and young women and old men who understand the power of all of us saying the same thing. We are going to declare God's promises into the future, not our reality, because the reality is this story is going to change. And God wins in the end and there is overwhelming triumph and God is going to do something where he begins to distinguish his people with righteousness and strength and his glory and his power. Because I believe that what I see in here is not what I see out there. And so until I see what I see in here is what I see out there, I'm gonna prophesy. I'm gonna prophesy. I'm not gonna allow nonsense to be the heritage of my grandbabies. I'm serious. We gotta know when we are. We are a people that God wants us to speak so that none of our words fall to the ground unfulfilled with God's promise and his power. So number one, you gotta know when you are. We are last day's people. Number two, you gotta know who you are. You gotta know who you are. We have a whole generation of people trying to figure out what they're called to do when they don't know who they are. And when you don't know who you are, it's impossible to figure out what you should be doing. 
but you don't find out who you are in the presence of people. You find out who you are in the presence of God. And so we have a generation that is being inundated and overwhelmed by the presence of people. And I'm not even talking about physical people. I'm talking about social media presence constantly inundated with opinions and the presence of people where they can no longer have an overwhelming sense of the presence of God. We need a generation to get into the presence of God because in the presence of God, God will call you forth by name. Now, I grew up a difficult child. I mean, like I already told you, I, I mean, my granddaughter is my fault. So I, I was definitely a challenge for both of my parents. And they were not Christians. My father was an alcoholic. And I grew up being called a lot of names. But then I got born again. And God began to call me forth in the likeness of not the name I had been or even the name I was, but the name I one day would be. He began to call me forth in destiny and strength. He began to speak things that made no sense about me whatsoever. God wants to call you forth by your destiny. God wants to shift things for you. He needs you to know who you are. When I wrote Without Rival, it was actually all in response to another jet lag moment. I had traveled home from South Korea and we had gone so quick, it was carry on only. I mean, it was like there and back. And, and I remember I was working on my book, Girls With Swords, when I fell asleep at my laptop. And I woke up eight pages later of the letter T. And I was like, I think I just better shut this down. And so I grabbed my dog and was laying down to go to sleep. And I heard God say something to me. He said, I do not love my children equally. I sat up and I thought, did I bring home a blasphemy spirit from South Korea? God, you have to love us all the same or it wouldn't be fair. He said, same implies that you are replaceable. He said, equal implies that my love can be measured. He said, I don't love my children equally. I love them uniquely. You know, I have four boys. I remember when I had my first son, I was so in love. I said, I want to have 20 of these. And then when I got pregnant with the second baby, I was so excited until right near the end of my pregnancy. I began to panic because I loved my firstborn so much. And then there was this stranger baby that looked like an alien in a sonogram. And I wasn't sure how I felt about him. And I realized I was going to have to cut the love I had for Addison in half and share it equally. But that's not what happened at all. When I had my second son, a whole nother portion of my heart opened up. And the things that I loved about Austin were very different than the things I loved about Addison. And the things I love about Alec are very different than the things I love about the other boys and the things I love about Arden. Why? Because they're all unique. Do you know that each and every one of us are woven to express God's love in this earth? We are uniquely loved. It is not cut into little pieces. There is a unique crafting on your life. And if you are going to have the best year ever, you are going to have to be the best you ever. You can no longer try to be everybody else. Matthew 16, 13, I'm gonna read it out of the message, says, when Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is? They replied, some think he is John the baptizer. Some say Elijah. Some Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He pressed them. And how about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus came back and said, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of a podcast or off of Twitter. My Father in heaven, God himself let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I am going to tell you who you are, really are. You're Peter, a rock. I want to tell you something. When you have a revelation of who God really is, then you're in his presence and he begins to tell you who you really are. 
Not who you've been, but who you really are. Not who you are yet, but who you really are. He goes on to say, you're Peter, a rock. Who had he been before? Simon. Simon means read like. What does that mean? Every time the wind blows, it means pliable. It means it's influenced by what it hears and says. And God was like, Peter, you've been this way, but I'm gonna tell you who you really are. You're rock solid. You're rock solid. I don't care what you've been in the past. There is somebody that you really are that God wants to tell you who you are. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will keep it out. Now that's really exciting right there, but he doesn't even stop there. He said, and that's not all. You will have, not Pastor Julie, you will have individually believers. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. And a no on earth is a no in heaven. You have complete access. You don't have to come through me. You don't have to go through anything. You have complete access to everything that Jesus died to provide for us. You have complete access but you just need to ask. And you won't ever ask if you don't know who you are. And you won't know what to ask for if you don't know when you are. We are in an urgent time period, so we need to be people who are standing between life and death and crying out for mercy. We need to be people who are understanding our season where everybody is flowing and being swayed. We need to be a rock because truth is not a river. Truth is a rock, and truth is not a what, truth is a who. Jesus is truth, and he is the living word of God, and thy word is truth. And that's not being mean to say the word is truth. We all need to be happy about things that being foundational, okay? So thy word is truth. So read the word of God, because when you read the word of God, it becomes a mirror, and you actually find out who you are. And then the third thing is, if you're gonna have the best year ever, it's gonna have to be a vision that causes you to remember that you're an answer. You're an answer. You're an answer. I had the most beautiful privilege in Thailand, speaking to about 3,500 people, and I would say probably out of that audience there was 2,500 women. And they had never heard that they were an answer. They'd always heard they were a problem. They always heard they were something to be controlled. And I just stood up all the women and said, you're an answer, not a problem, and you would have thought that I said that they had won a million dollars. They just began to weep and shake and their whole countenance changed. Do you know that even your problems can end up being an answer for other people? Do you know that? I'm a little bit naughty and I like, I like danger. I, I don't know why. I had a motorcycle till my son wrecked it. I, I, I just, like, we were just in Thailand and there was this really dangerous channel on these like tattooed like snorkeling, like free diving guys were swimming across and, and my son saw them and, and the, the like boat people were like, that's a really dangerous channel. They should not be swimming across that channel. Arden looks at me, we make eye contact. We both dive off the boat. Why? I don't know. I, halfway over that, I was like, I'm gonna die. I'm going to die. I'm like swimming and not going anywhere. I'm moving. My son finally had to just grab me and pull me in when he got to his feet down. But we loved it. I love danger. And so I was invited to speak to, in Dubai. Now, Dubai is not dangerous. Dubai is interesting, but it's not dangerous. And so I had told my husband, hey, I love you. And he's like, wait, you're not speaking in Dubai until next Friday. Why are you leaving on Sunday? And I said, oh, did I forget to tell you I'm going to Iraq? He was like, what? You are not going to Iraq. I said, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go to Iraq. And he's like, no, you're not going to Iraq. He said, like, who are you going with? I said, by myself. And he was like, you are not going to Iraq by yourself. I said, yeah, it's gonna be great. They're picking me up at the airport. He's like, where are you going in Iraq? I said, I don't know how to pronounce the city. He was like, you are not going to Iraq by yourself to a city that you don't know how to even pronounce. And I said, look at me, look at me. I look like them. I can completely go to Iraq. Julie cannot go to Iraq. I can go to Iraq. So I went to Iraq. I went to Iraq. And I, um, 
I went there to see what this organization called Preemptive Love was doing. And because I, I really love being able to spend my influence on behalf of people that are doing amazing things. And so they had said, come, you can sleep in our basement. And I was like, on it. And so I showed up and, and I went with them all over the place. And I found out pretty quick that I was utterly useless. Like I made the, the fatal error of complimenting something. They had made this purple juice that I thought was grape drink. And I took a sip of it and it ended up being um, radish or something purple, like a beet or not a beet. I like beets, something scary. I don't know what it was. It's turnips, it's like a purple turnip juice. So when you think you're drinking grape and then all of a sudden you take a sip and it's like, whoa. And I was like, wow. And they thought I was like, she wants more. And so they gave me like an entire gallon of it. And I was like, no, seriously, you need to keep it. And the people were looking at me like, we can't take you anywhere. This is like eight pounds of their vegetables. You shouldn't take it. I was like, now I'm going to have to drink it and throw up. But it was like, these people were so gracious. Everywhere we went, they ran out to meet the people that I was with, but I couldn't speak Arabic. I couldn't speak Yazidi. I couldn't speak Kurdish. I just watched. I watched everything that was happening. And then on the last day I was there, the last place we went, there was 14 people living in the back of a semi-trailer. Now, I met people that were living in containers that two years earlier were living in Mosul, making $500,000 a year. When ISIS came through, they took all the money. There was no Federal Reserve. The money had all been there. And so I'm sitting there, and all the children came running out, they had sheep everywhere. And I noticed there was one little girl that just kind of hung back. She just kind of hung back. She's about six or seven years of age, same age as my granddaughter, Sophia. And we all were sitting in the trailer, in the back of the trailer, and they're talking and asking them how they can do different things. And I'm sitting and listening. And I, I look over, and I see this one little girl that has been kind of away from everybody is in the corner. And so I finally, I turned to Jessica, and I said, what's, what's going on? What's going on with that little girl over there? And she said, oh, she lost an eye to retinoblastoma. And we have not been able to get her a prosthetic eye that really works. And she's in a lot of like uncomfortableness. And I said, you bring that baby girl over here right now. And I put this little girl on my lap. Her name is Sarah. And I said, Sarah, I've lost my eye at the same age as you to the same cancer tumor. I tried to close her eye, and it was an adult prosthetic eye, so it would not even close. Arden, can you put up the little before picture? Okay, this is me in Iraq with Sarah. Look at her little face. She's like, why am I on a strange American person's lap? I don't <laughs> want to be with this person, and now they're taking a picture of me. I mean, she's like, what in the world? And so I spent a sleepless night thinking about her. And I couldn't bring back her dad who had been killed by ISIS. I didn't get to talk to her mom when I was there, but I thought I can go back to the United States of America and I can get that girl a good false eye that will actually close. And so I came back and I've got a picture of Sarah afterwards. I came back to the US and connected with her and there she is. And her whole countenance completely changed. And you know, when I was sitting with her, I showed her pictures of my family. And I said, Sarah, you know what? You can dream. Sarah, you can have kids one day. Sarah, you can be loved. And I remember she kept like touching my face and kind of like not believing me that my eye was fake, which it is. If anybody wants to touch it afterwards, you can. I'll close it. <laughs> but, but she was, she was, so excited to find out that she was not alone. There's something so powerful about knowing you're not isolated and yet somebody's on the other side of it and they've seen the answer. I, I have another picture, but I didn't bring it, but we sent all the, those little girls, Lizzie the Lioness book in Iraq, and so they're like running around roaring and being courageous and understanding that the most brave thing you can do is ask for help. But here's the thing, I wanna read this scripture to you because this is what we're seeing evident in 2 Peter 1, three through five. It says, everything, everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been 
miraculously given to us by getting to know and pers- know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. The best invitation we've ever received. We were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you. Your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on a world corrupted by lust. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given. You have been given everything. Not just everything, but absolutely everything that you need to have the best year ever. Everything that you need in the promises of God. These are miraculous promises of God. These are not like, eh, it's okay, like whatever the worst seat in the house might be. These are the absolute miraculous provision of God. And each of us have been given everything, everything that we need to live a life that pleases God, pleases God. Pleasing God, so much of that is actually being everything that God created us to be. He weaves each of us with dreams and wonders and hopes and when we are fully alive to his promise in us, then he is seen through us. So you're an answer, not a problem. Next step to having the best year ever is you need to write it down. You need to write it down. You know, there's so many ideas and things that the Holy Spirit has whispered to me, maybe in the middle of the night or as I'm waking up that I think I'm going to remember later, and I forget it. And they'll have been beautiful things, and I'll think, oh, I don't, it's, it's gone. But when you write something down, you honor it with weight. You say, that's, that's valuable to me. You know, I, I, I have handwriting that looks like I might be a terrorist. Uh, but, but, I mean, it's like a scrawl, like I'm threatening people when I write them notes. But, but the truth is, I still value handwritten notes more than I do text messages. When somebody takes the time to write something down, it has a different meaning. And when God whispers something to you and you write it down, everything shifts. It's like saying, God, I actually believe that what was just a whisper and what was just a passing thought was something that you you wanted me to write down. You know, we had dinner last night with Pastor Todd and Julie, and they told us how the first time they went through the Port St. Lucie building, that the Holy Spirit whispered and said, this is yours. This is yours, but just not now. Writing that down gives you a clarity and a peace and a hope and an anchor and a foundation. Habakkuk 2.1 says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and when, what I will answer concerning my complaint. You know, we actually have a watch post and a station. For me, it's watch post over my grandkids, watch post over my sons, watch post over my marriage, watch post over my community, watch post over some of the young women that have come to me and said, I need you to mentor me. I have to understand I have a watch post and I have a station and I have this ability to climb a tower. I love this idea of climbing a tower because you get an aerial view. And that's something I actually love about being older is having an aerial view about what's actually really important and what's not such a big deal anymore. And it says the righteous will live by faith and the next line that it says write the vision. Make it plain on the tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. Well, I'll wait till it's time. No, you write it now and you run with it later. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, it always does. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. God will bring this forth in the fullness of time by writing it down now. You will actually have a roadmap that you will recognize it Later, you'll be able to say, this is that, that he spoke to me 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or maybe just even in September. This is that that I wrote down at the end of January for my best year ever. This is that. And then the last thing is, 
Vision requires the right conversations with the right people. I'm just going to go to the Godfather for this. You know, there are lessons you can learn from Godfather 1. First and foremost, you never tell anyone outside of the family what you're thinking. But you do tell people in the family what you're thinking. We got a lot of people talking to a lot of strangers about things that need to be spoken to with people that are family. We need to get the right people around the right table having the right conversations. And social media turns into a mob really quick. So just because you have an opinion, don't feel like you have to share it. There are so many tweets I have written and have not posted. I'm like, that felt good to type that out now. I'm going to delete it. There are certain things that you don't necessarily need to say to everyone. But you do need to say it to the family. And Julie was sharing how she was talking about being fully invested. Fully invested means you have hard conversations. Fully invested means I'm going to care enough to talk to you about some stuff. And then the second lesson from the Godfather, never go against the family. Does the church need to change? Does she need to grow? Absolutely. But when we attack the church on social media or talk bad about things, what are we doing? It's like we're pulling up the, my pants on, pulling up the, the <laughs> church's skirt and saying, look at her. We don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We, we want to wash her with the water of the word. We want to do what Jesus does. We want to gather people where we see a problem and say, well, how can we all come together and be an answer? I believe that this church is a gateway for Florida. I believe that God has each of you here as gatekeepers and vision declares and prophesiers. And God wants you to have your best year ever because tied to your best year ever is something that is best for this area. I totally believe that America's destiny is greater than her history. And sometimes that takes faith for me to say that right now. But I believe that our nation that is torn in half right now on so many different issues is going to wake up and remember who is really her real adversary. And we are going to begin to be united and one. So I'm going to prophesy unity and faith and strength and clarity and truth instead of nonsense. I'm going to close with a quote from C.S. Lewis because it would be wrong for me to close with a quote from The Godfather. Uh, C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Weight of Glory, it's one of my favorite quotes. It says, if we, and that needs to be all of us, consider, and I need you if this is going to be the best year, to actually consider the unblushing promises of reward promised in the Gospels. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. If this is going to be your best year ever, I cannot afford for you to be far too easily pleased. Can you stand to your feet right now? I want to pray a grandmother prayer over you. Father, I thank you that it is a divine declaration that 2018 is a year without rival. So, Father, show them when they are. Show them who they are. Father, shift their images to an answer. Let them have their divine identity by you calling them by name. Father, I thank you that they will write down things in faith that you will astound them with later because of your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If this spoke to you on any level, we do have, I brought here uh, my book, Without Rival, and uh, we also have DVDs to Insights to a life without rival. Do I have somebody that's in college that's like poor that says, I want this? Come on, do I have anybody in college? I'll know if, come on. Okay, come come running. Whoever the college person gets here first. So I've got to, there you go. All right. And uh, sorry about that. It was, it was, she came fast. She came fast. All right. And then do we have any breastfeeding mothers? I know sometimes this can be embarrassing, but you know, I believe that 
breastfeeding mothers also need to be part of changing the world. And so I read my books out loud. I mispronounce things with intense passion. So if you are here and you're, there you go, breastfeeding mothers. Here you go. All right, you are most welcome. And then we have the book out there. Pastor Julie, Pastor David, it's yes. been an incredible Come on, honor. one more time. Can we thank Lisa Bevere for that incredible message? All right, church. You heard her, right? You heard her. We're the answer. We've got the vision. So let's carry that out with us this week. There is a lot of Lisa Bevere and John Bevere materials in our connector. Of course, we've got the new bookstore. But if you need prayer, our prayer team's coming forward. We'd love to meet with you. You do not have to go home, church. You can go hang out in the Life Center. We're glad that you're here. All right, we'll see you back here next weekend. Bye-bye.